like to hand over to Veronica Miller, whom you know probably um, as the chair of the HPV Forum, and Adam Gehring, who is an expert in HPV immunology, having been in London, Singapore, and now being also in Toronto. So Veronica and Adam. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you uh, to all the speakers. The, this was an incredible set of talks um, to bring us up to date. And we have a very impressive uh, panel um, that will follow, uh, which includes Harry Jansen, who has already been introduced. So uh, the only thing I want to mention, Harry, um, is that I see that you have mentored over 50 PhD students. And I do have to say, you look extremely young. Uh, to have achieved uh, so many offspring um, amongst your academic networks. We have Bill Villani, uh, who is um, um, the, uh, uh, sorry, he is an assembly bioscientist as chief scientific officer, and he was previously at Gilead. Uh, I will keep these very short because we are short of time, so I, I won't mention everything I know about all of you. We have Professor Yun, uh, who sees uh, patients um, at Queen Mary Hospital at the University of Hong Kong. He's been there for over 20 years, and his research interests, of course, include prevention, natural history, molecular vir virology, and treatment of chronic hepatitis B and C. Uh, we have Gavin Cloherty, who is head of infectious diseases research for Abbott uh, Diagnostic Business. And uh, he's one of the top experts in the field, and we all know him as a very collaborative individual who has collaborated with many um, other institutions, ministries of health, government, CDC, um, etc. And um, he was also very instrumental uh, with the work at the Republic of Georgia to help eradicate hepatitis C. We have Jenny Yang, uh, who is a Senior Director of Clinical Research at Gilead Sciences. And she's worked on several of the hepatitis C drugs, uh, but now she is um, working with the team uh, on hepatitis B. Uh, going of on, we have Oliver uh, Lenz, uh, who is the Scientific Director of Clinical Microbiology and Immunology at Janssen Infectious Diseases. And um, he has uh, received his PhD at the University of Marburg, Germ uh, Germany, uh, where he worked mainly on hemorrhagic fever viruses. And he is also the co-chair of the Hepatitis B Forum Circuit Endpoints Working Group. And last but not least, we have Anna Maria Garetti, uh, who has a dual appointment as expert scientist as, at Roche Pharma and early development in Switzerland and as professor of virology and infectious disease and in consultant at the University of Liverpool in the UK. And, um, and with that, um, we, I will pass it on. I believe I have mentioned everyone. And I will pass it back to Adam, uh, who will initiate the panel discussion. I will monitor the chat box. So if there are any specific questions for the panelists, please put them in the chat box. But I will let Adam, who's already been introduced by Ulla, and uh, who will initiate the panel discussion. And thank you again for, uh, for all of your expert participation. We might go a little bit over time to 2.30, uh, just because the panel is starting so late. Um, so, uh, for those of you who can stay on a little bit, we appreciate that. So, Adam, over to you. Thank you, Veronica. So, good day, everybody. As uh, Veronica said, I'm Adam Gehring, immunologist. I'm happy to, uh, to moderate this panel today. So, we've had a great review of the existing biomarkers and assays in development, very educational and, and, and really getting into the details. Uh, the list of biomarkers continues to grow. Uh, our technology allows us to do large serum biomarker exploratory analyses and you know, liver fine needle aspirates are allowing us to start longitudinally sampling the liver. So the whole purpose and in, in, in the objective around this panel discussion today imposed by ICHBV is what biomarkers are really most needed to cure uh, for HPV cure endpoints. So I thought to kick off the discussion, I have a couple of 
top level questions around uh, viral biomarkers and the immunological biomarkers, which have both been summarized now nicely. And uh, thanks to Harry's presentation there just a bit ago, he's answered some of these, but I'd like to get the panel to weigh in on, you know, on, the, on the viral biomarker side of this. So the question I have for the panel to start considering and discussing is, do we now have the appropriate biomarkers, the viral biomarkers to measure CCC DNA activity and the replication of cycle of HBV? And are these new biomarkers actually more relevant to confirm mechanism of action for novel drugs, or are they going to have a real clinical difference? So, you know, with that, um, maybe I'll start with, with Bill, because he's in the top left of my Zoom screen, so <laughs> he gets to go first. All right. Um, um, thanks very much, Adam. Good to see you. So, um, yeah, I think there's clearly a need for, for, for new biomarkers and, and, and there's going to be a period of time and we need to develop the clinical experience with the, the current markers that have been discussed today to, to learn pr predictive value in, in different patient populations. But I think we, we have this challenge where we often have low or undetectable DNA, you know, in patients that are being treated. Um, but we have high surface antigen levels, and so we have this dichotomy that it, it's, it's really hard to move surface antigen, but we can't see what's going on with replication below the limits of con conventional detection with the current assays. And that's where I think, um, you know, serum RNA as well as uh, correlated antigen and some of the other markers can be, can be quite useful. Um, I, I think there's emerging evidence now that, that RNA is important in looking at um, treatment response and, and treatment withdrawal. There's um, work coming out of China, Professor Ho's lab in China, that suggests you know being DNA negative and RNA negative and maybe core related antigen negative as well as a predictor for sustained response after treatment, which is which is I think really encouraging. Um, I think correlated antigen, you know, was was really well presented today by by Jamie and Hu that it, it it actually represents multiple proteins. So that's that that is a challenge to to, to interpret. And I, I agree with Jamie that a, that a core antigen specific um, uh, marker would be really helpful because that might be a more direct link to CCC DNA itself. So um, those are some opening thoughts. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Bill. So uh, just to keep it moving in an orderly fashion, I, I will move on to Anna Maria next. So your thoughts really on these viral and biomarkers being, you know, in, in terms of mechanism of action and, and clinical relevance in, in, in the concept of clinical trials in particular. Thank you, Adam. Um, well, I think that the presentations brought into quite a sharp focus, the fact that uh, we have uh, multiple opportunities there, but also some significant challenges in, um, first of all, understanding the integrated view of how to use all the different markers together to give us a better, better answer than just a single marker. So the first opportunity I see is work around the integration of the multiple, mark multiple markers. Um, and there was an aspect of what we discussed earlier, particularly around the presentations, the earlier presentations, um, around the immunology and, and, and also the presentation from Barbara, there was an aspect that sort of um, uh, has, has really resonated with me, which is how can we also, besides the biological parameters so that we are making enormous progress with understanding, how can we integrate them with immunological parameters that are easy or relatively easy uh, to assess, such as the serum biomarkers? Is there a phenotype that could be identified by the combination of multiple biological markers with some uh, key immunological markers. And if we think that that's the way to go, um, then what kind of work do we need to do? Because it's obvious that there is work to be done. What kind of work do we need to do? Barbara talk, talked about more translational studies being required. So um, how do we define the studies that are required? And as a, as a, as a group, as a, a scientific community, um, where do we identify, you know, where do we see the needs and how do we identify, you know, the work that we want to do um, uh, around the, the, sort of the studies? Because in early development, now talking about the sort of clinical trial, early clinical trial, there is a lot of scope for uh, technical validations, but there is limited scope for clinical validation because of the limited number of patients that get recruited into the study. And something that Harry pointed out quite clearly, which is also 
uh, our experience is that very often the patients that come into the studies are very um, specific in terms, for instance, of having been on nukes for many years, um, only about 40% or so have any detectable RNA at entry, so we have the issue of sensitivity and so forth. So um, what do we need to do across academia, across industry, to provide that uh, opportunity for more translational studies and to integrate the two? So this is my key takeaway, sort of uh, impression, if you like, from this morning uh, presentation, this afternoon presentation. Okay. Thank I'm you. Also um, if I can add one, one question for Harry. Harry, you, you spoke specifically also about greater sensitivity uh, and also the same for Florian around a greater sensitivity of the RNA assay. Um, what, what is the next way to get there? Because the assays now, from a technical perspective, are already relatively sensitive. So, what's the next step? What do we do to improve? their performance. So that is, you know, just an open question that I would like to, to pose. Is it more sample? Is it more, you know, sample preparation prior to the test? Yeah, that's, that's a question that Kevin could answer in, in a second, uh, and maybe Bill as well. Um, I, I, what I would say, the tests are not sensitive enough to ensure uh, pure disease. That's, that's basically what I'm saying, right? If, if it, we're, we're aiming for basically treating patients with a finite duration of treatment and getting them in a sustainable uh, off-treatment remission uh, and, and pure. So, um, and we just don't see it, just HPV RNA, and I think HPV RNA is definitely a more promising marker in my view than correlated antigen, uh, but we don't see it happening uh, yet. So I would say that there, if we could, increase the sensitivity of that assay, it might help. Um, there's other ways to use biomarkers, if I can uh, elaborate on that. I think we, we need to do better studies on how to combine different biomarkers, as you already mentioned, uh, Anna Maria. That's, I think, important, uh, and particularly, uh, potentially also uh, immunological biomarkers um, should be uh, uh, should be included in that in, in the arena. We have unfortunately very few that have been well validated and they're not always very easy to validate. So those are other ways to, to hope that with the uh, set of biomarkers that we have in our hands, that um, we would have a, a better way uh, to see which patients really has an off treatment sustained response. Another opportunity is to look within the liver which is a bit more, more of a hassle, obviously, with, with fine needle aspiration biopsies, uh, which are very thin needles and which is not very invasive, actually, not more invasive than a venipuncture. We might be able to look within the liver as well. That's another thing that we could discuss later on. But um, maybe Kevin and, and, and Bill yeah. Delaney can comment I, I, on the uh, technicalities. So the, the, I think you know you're, you're you're hitting a lot of the. What I agree with uh, with many of the points you just made, Harry, in terms of using panels together, and that one uh, one marker is not really going to be the, the panacea, the one the, the silver bullet. I think from a sensitivity perspective, for us, one of the key things that we were um, grappling with was uh, people's willingness to part with precious blood. And so you know, I think uh, you mentioned uh, a sample volume. So that's one way that we could look at uh, making things more sensitive. Um, you know, if we were to try and look at HIV for inspiration, um, you know, various groups tried different things. You know, there was the spinning down samples that had its own complications or Meller's approach to uh, his Raven approach, which is just running multiple replicates. And we in, in our lab have methods that are much more sensitive than the one that we currently uh, have on the highly automated platform, but that, that brings in another, another angle um, is the desire to have uh, it, things in a highly automated fashion so that we can do the kind of work with the numbers of patients, which I think Anna also brought up, that uh, can generate meaningful results. Um, you know, without breaking the bank or my thumbs and, and pipetting in the, in the lab. So doing things on the machines uh, definitely helps in that one. But um, you know, uh, it, it, one of the, just as, as if I can, an overall comment, 
I think um, we're starting to learn a lot more about the markers that we already have uh, in natural history and, and to, to see their, their value or with current standard of care therapies. I think what's going to be very interesting is the nuances of all of these markers with the new therapies with different mechanisms of action and how they play together uh, to tell us more about what's going on. That's just yeah, Harry, I, I, I agree with what was what you've said. I think enhanced sensitivity would be extremely useful. You know, I think the serum isn't reflecting everything that's going on in the liver in terms of replication or CCC DNA activity. So I, I think there's some ground that can be gained over the assays we're using now. However, as Gavin just suggested, there, there will be a limit and that it's, it's going to be about using um, all of the available endpoints that we can to get an integrated picture. Yeah, this, I, 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 you know, I, I want to, maybe we could finish up, I want to do some immunology here as well, because uh, I know that the time is going short, but this has come up by a few people in terms of, what about the idea of a composite score once we get more information on this, something that's used for, for fibrosis in that case, so maybe MF, you could uh, give your thoughts, or, or Jenny or Oliver, maybe after MF, and uh, sort of a composite score of these new viral biomarkers in, in conjunction with what we already measure. Sorry, can I say again, what, what score? Sort of a composite score of multiple oh, different okay. measurements, so core antigen, RNA, yeah. DNA. Yes, in, in fact, uh, I, I totally agree with what, what uh, all of you have said uh, about the sensitivity, because uh, I mean, if we have good sensitivity to do the test for COVID detection as well as the RNA, the composite score is actually definitely helping. And just like the, the, the same situation where we have the score for HCC development using age, albumin, I mean, the antigen, DNA, surface antigen. So if you add all this in, into one formula or score, then we can actually have good prediction uh, for, for whatever, whatever outcome you are looking for. For example, complications rate, I mean, treatment response, or even stopping of therapy. I mean, one example that we are, I mean, in fact, Harry had already mentioned the conclusion that uh, we, we actually find that, I mean, if we combine the COVID engine plus, sorry, the surface engine plus the RNA levels, then actually it has a quite a good prediction for, for response or sustained response after stopping of treatment. So this is one of the example where we can combine, I mean, two or even three markers, uh, be it, I mean, virologically or immunologically, then we actually have a, I mean, a valid, valid data score and then we can rely on and then we can make a, a clinical decisions wisely. So I mean, people will, I mean, uh, we will, will, I, I think, I mean, as a clinician, people love this kind of scores, I would say. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank Adam, you. Could I ask, could I ask, um, could I ask, and, and would this score have to be population specific? Or perhaps should the validation then be um, alert of the possibility of variation across different populations? Do you think that should be a consideration or a concern? Uh, I, I mean, honestly, I, I don't know the answer, but uh, I mean, if you are predicting the, I mean, for example, treatment relapse uh, using this, this score, I mean, I mean, I don't, I don't see, I mean, any difference between Asian and Caucasian. Uh, with different studies looking at surface antigen, DNA, and RNA. So I would, I would predict, I mean, if we have a score combining all this, then I, I think it will be, I mean, I mean, genuinely applicable to all, all patients. All, I mean, obviously we need studies to prove that, but I mean, I mean, with the experience that we have for other markers, I, I think, I mean, this score will probably be, will be very, I mean, general and also applicable to all, all, all kinds of patients. Unless you are talking about genotypes, otherwise, I mean, I, I don't think there will be any difference. So, which, which obviously um, goes back to the issue of, you know, if we want to do translational studies, then a collaborative approach at such studies is going to be important in terms of numbers um, and also in terms of uh, representation in order to confirm the assumptions. Sure. Yeah. Definitely. Thank, thank you. So maybe Oliver and at least a little bit of immunology before we get out there, I would be shameful if I didn't. So, um, you know, in, in relation to the, bio, bio, the viral biomarkers, the immune, immunology biomarkers are a little less developed. Um, you know, so far, you know, with the immune targeting drugs, you know, the immune biomarkers are relatively logical. 
but most of the immune biomarkers we have in patients are really measuring measured during inflammation. It's really looking at mechanisms of liver damage. So in your perspective, uh, how urgent do you think a predictive biomarker is, an immun a predictive immunological biomarker, either for inflammation or antiviral responses? So maybe Oliver, you can, you can start. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it a try. As a biologist talking about immunology and <clears throat> biomarkers. So predictive of what? I think that we always, in, if you're talking about biomarkers, we have to keep in mind what we're using them for. And obviously with immune targeting drugs, we'll have to look for PD markers <clears throat> just to measure if these drugs work actually as <clears throat> they're supposed to work. In terms of predicting off treatment response or ultimately functional cure, that's, I think, a very high task <clears throat> to look into. Um, I think it will be key in clinical studies, absolutely, <clears throat> to collect sufficient samples and assess, <clears throat> sorry, assess these biomarkers to see uh, how that correlates with off treatment response, for example. So, uh, not sure if I really answered your question. I think it will be very key to look into those uh, biomarkers to see uh, what this can, uh, how they will correlate with, with response. The challenge being, of course, is what do we look at and how do we collect the samples? <clears throat> it will be very challenging to collect sufficient blood samples, for example, to the functional assays where we need substantially levels of <clears throat> T cells. <clears throat> we need substantial. Um, validated and standardized assays. So that's a challenge to, to go for, but it's certainly worth the effort. I think we have to say that the virology markers are much more advanced, but they're currently still insufficient. So there's a piece in the puzzle missing, which is certainly the immune aspect, which we have to bring into the picture um, more consistently as we go forward. Thank you, Oliver. Yes, yeah, so, so Jenny, um... Yeah, in this case, you know, immune biomarkers, you know, mechanism of action, predictive of inflammation, antiviral therapy, treatment responses. I mean, what, what's your perspective here? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think biomarkers and immune biomarkers are really key to our understanding of achieving cure. Um, it, it is earlier in terms of our understanding of, uh, you know, we, we don't have the same understanding as viral markers that we do with the immune markers, as you mentioned. For us, I think, you know, it's also a big gap in terms of our understanding of, you know, how the peripheral biomarkers might, you know, reflect what we see in the liver immune microenvironment. There's there's quite a difference there. So I think it's, we have to be careful what we're using these biomarkers for, but you know, in all of our studies in which we're evaluating uh, immune modulation, we do include the collection of you know, PBMCs and whole blood, um, really taking care uh, with our PBMC collection, for example, to collect functionally viable PBMCs so that we can evaluate you know, functional changes um, in you know, the periphery. And, also work with a lot of collaborators to evaluate, you know, and compare markers that we see in the periphery with those that we see in the liver in order to kind of get a more broader understanding of how these changes might reflect liver changes. So, I, you know, similar to what Oliver said, I, I think, you know, it, it depends on what we use these biomarkers for, whether it's evaluating the PD of the immune modulation or whether we're trying to see, you know, on target engagement of our drugs um, through the periphery um, evaluation. Adam, could I bounce, could I bounce the question back to you? Because you're, you're the only true immunologist on this panel but working on this for decades. I also see that Mala Maini is on the, uh, in the group. So, so what, from your perspective, would be viable biomarkers, which are easy, to, rather easy to use, and be able to validate well in the setting of uh, trying to cure hepatitis B? Yeah, thanks, Harry. You're, dis you're, dis you're, uh, you're disconnected now and then, uh, Adam. All right, maybe I'm better now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. The the challenge I would say for immunologic biomarkers is really that 
strong correlate of functional cure? What is that one immunologic, immunological marker that's going to, to identify those patients that lose S antigen? And we really don't have that yet. I think where we're in much better position is to predict inflammation or understand what those mechanisms of inflammation are going to be based on uh, the nice summary from Kyung Mi. I mean, you know, measuring cytokines and, and chemokines um, has, I think, so far been of limited value, and we have to expand out a bit beyond that um, because they're really only largely present in patients at the time of inflammation. So I really think that there are immunological biomarkers that we just haven't identified yet that might be in the liver uh, that are more sensitive than cytokines and chemokines. And I think it just takes a, a, a deeper analysis. And some, to some extent, these exploratory biomarker panels might get us there, um, but they're a lot like RNA sequencing. They return a lot, and then you have to make sense of the data. Uh, and really identify that one marker. So uh, if Mala can be unmuted and she wants to weigh in, that, that's, uh, I also appreciate her opinion. Hi, everybody. Um, I mean, Hi. I think we don't, of course, have the answer to this yet. Um, we've got a great chance to really start to address it now because we've got drugs that can really impact on the virus and start to move us nearer to functional cure in, in larger numbers of people. And so we can really start to dissect this. We've got lots of interesting candidate immunological biomarkers, a lot of debate about how much we'll be able to get this from the periphery or whether we really need to go into the liver with fine needle aspirates. But now's the time when we can really start to get at that um, question finally. Um, and we're writing a paper about this. So <laughs> we'll have a paper out, all of us together, which is sort of, discussing the pros and cons of all these different immunological biomarkers because it's as you know pretty complicated right 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 okay, so, maybe, oh oliver go ahead yeah i was just going to ask a more provocative question to the immunologists uh, off treatment response assessed by hbs antigen loss is hbs antigen loss and we know this is to have off treatment response we need immune control is HPS antigen loss by itself maybe the best marker of a restoration of the immune system? Uh, I mean, in, in, in my perspective, a lot of times HPS antigen typically doesn't fall off very quickly. It's going down quite rapidly after treatment intervention, but still the duration and the durability of that are unknown. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's hard to tie one immunological event to a prolonged decline in S, S loss. You know, so like particularly where in some of these STOP studies that have associated uh, you know, this S decline with immunological response, but these follow-ups are three and four years, it's quite difficult to identify a specific measure of immunity in that case. Mala? Yeah, I mean, I would actually sort of argue maybe the opposite. The, one, the people who are losing S antigen, often it looks to me like they're on their way to doing that anyway. They're starting off with quite low levels. It's probably mainly coming from integrated DNA. And they're not necessarily the best group to identify um, immune markers from. Um, they're, they're looking at something separate, perhaps, to immune control. And actually, the, the STOP study that we just helped um, Chavi Fawn's group with recently, which was presented at EASL, sort of was in line with that, where we saw interesting increases in the virus-specific T cells in the people who had sustained immune control of therapy, but not in the group who lost their antigen. Um, so I think, yeah, I think we definitely need more than just looking at loss of S antigen. We've got to be able to do, do better than that with immune markers. So thank you. And this is Veronica Capuchin. Shall we go on for a few more minutes? We still have 117 participants. I know we're we're ten minutes past the past the hour. Oh, I um, sorry, I'm not seeing all my chats here. Uh, fine by me, she says. Okay, so um, let's keep going for a little bit. So one of the questions that came in via the chat is uh, just to make things a little bit more complicated. 
is uh, from Ahmed Ashkar uh, Kawi uh, saying, did we get the dynamics right? You know, so should we be measuring, um, you know, immune markers much more frequently rather than just at 12 weeks, which is uh, frequently done. And uh, because, uh, you know, we may not be catching the dynamics of it. And uh, so I just wanted to throw that out there. And he also raises some uh, questions about collaboration uh, regarding, are there any plans to form a central biorepository, for example, that could really aid the field um, with everyone uh, pitching in on that. And um, he also has a question about platform trials. And um, that again is, is quite a complicated question. So maybe we can just really um, start talking about the first two in terms of the dynamics of the biomarkers and also the uh, plans or potential plans for a biorepository. Uh, so let me uh, start again, maybe with some of the um, the sponsors here, pharmaceutical sponsors, so Jenny, uh, Bill, and Oliver, uh, in terms of your thinking about the um, the dynamics of these of these studies and and um, how you would look at that in terms of your own pharma R and D program for HPV cure. Uh, Veronica, I have to drop out. I have a hard stop. This is not, not out of this interest, but uh, great discussion. No, we understand. And I think uh, it is well already 13 minutes over the originally scheduled right. time. I just thought since we had some more participants. Yeah, yeah go, go, go ahead. Don't, don't, I'll, I'll just uh, leave now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Yeah, um, maybe, maybe I'll just answer. Um, well, the question that I think I heard regarding potentially collecting samples um, at earlier time points. Um, I, you know, for, for our studies, we, we do collect, uh, you know, at earlier time points round around, you know, trying to gauge it to where we might see the highest um, PD effect from our drugs. Um, however, when you look at longer term treatment, you know, collecting PD markers more frequently is very difficult um, as you know, especially if we're looking at PVNCs, it's, it's quite process intense um, to collect functionally viable PVNCs. So we try to um, collect them around the time when we would actually see some, uh, you know, virologic changes that we can then correlate back to the immune changes. So we, we tend to want to wait a little bit later and 12 weeks is an earlier time point um, that we would see declined potentially in you know surface angio or other viral markers that we can correlate to, which is why twelve weeks is a very common time point that mm -hmm. we do collect. Yeah, Oliver, what are your thoughts regarding um, um, the the dynamics of these markers and additional time points, but also kind of getting at the question of what will it take to validate, to confirm? to integrate these assays and, and um, you know, have the whole field move forward rather than individual companies one at a time. Yeah, <clears throat> well, maybe let's start with the first question and the, and the timing. And I think Jenny nicely summarized that. It's always a challenge between taking su sufficient samples, uh, but still making the study acceptable to patients. <laughs> And I think the timing also depends a bit on the kinetics and the specificities of your antiviral or regimens you're, you're assessing. If you have regimens which take some time until you see some changes in certain parameters, it doesn't really make sense to start sampling too early. So I think Vic12 <clears throat> generally has been a very yeah, logical approach, especially if you're talking about 48 weeks of treatment. But of course, mm -hmm. we need to look earlier. The question is, of course, also which measures do you look at, which markers do you look at, and how do, com do you combine them? And I think as many companies, we will be looking as much, at as much as possible in terms of biologic and immunological markers, and then combine the data. And look how this on-treatment response correlates with off-treatment response, and hopefully find predictors for response. And that might be a combination of different markers, it might be a single marker, we might be ending up saying that HPS antigen still is the best one to use. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how can we all as a group in the HPV field learn from each other and uh, share reagents or learnings? 
it's not an easy one to answer <coughs> since each study, each company, of course, has its interest to move their own programs forward and to learn. Um, I think in general, the field is open to publish data very proactively and discuss findings very actively. I think ICE HPV and the forum are both good venues to, to bring some of these discussions together so that we can mm -hmm. all learn from each other. Great, thank you, Oliver. And Bill, your thoughts on, on these questions? Yeah, I'll start with um, maybe the, the, the collaboration aspect. I, I think this is a really important, um, this, is, this is really important. If you look at the history of HIV and, and HCV, that it's you know, rarely one company that comes up with all the new mechanisms and all the answers. And, it, and, it, and often the combination therapies use components from multiple companies. And so, so um, and, I, and I think we saw that a, a, a lot in, in HCV as well uh, as, as the initial breakthroughs were made. So um, that, that's something that I, you know, is extremely important. And you know, we, we're, we are certainly pursuing at, at assembly is, is, is combinations with other mechanisms of actions with, with other companies. And um, you know, this should lead to learning more and, and being able to answer some of these questions in the clinic. I think this is really the most important thing. What we need is, is to test these new mechanisms you know, in, in the clinic and, and generate the data in the patients. And I'm um, also optimistic that um, there'll be you know, sharing and, 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 and centralization of, of reagents. I, I know HBV is working on this and I believe NIH as well as, as, a, as a repository that's forming for, for critical mm -hmm. reagents. So I, I think definitely more of this is needed and, and, and is welcome. Great, wonderful. And I it, think we see the beginnings. Anna Maria? Yes, I wanted to also, I mean, I, I agree with everything that's said and I wanted to um, highlight one aspect. So certainly within the Roche trials, there is a um, strategy to collect the samples as frequently as it is possible. And I appreciate exactly the point about the fair balance between uh, taking bloods for you know, extensive PK analysis and safety as well as biomarkers um, and, and what's acceptable to, to, to patients. So that's a fine balance to take, but there is um, a commitment to certainly explore the utility the limitation being in the numbers. So again, I think I, I go back to my initial point um, to say that the collaborative efforts and the idea of you know, looking at translational studies in addition to the clinical trial studies, I think is going to be very, very important looking forward. But one question I wanted to pose, if I may, um, is the collection of PBMCs. I think we can all appreciate how valuable they can be. Uh, but anybody who's been trying to collect PBMCs within clinical trials um, will know of the difficulties. And I'd like to, to know whether there is a solution around that, what can be done, um, because uh, no matter how much effort uh, one puts into this, as we know, you may have 14 sites in your clinical trial, but maybe only three or four may contribute PBMC from perhaps a couple of patients. So how do we solve the problem of the, you know, collecting functional cells for, for you know, functionally, um, uh, you know, uh, um, effective cells for, for the big type of assays? Great. So that's uh, a very important question, obviously, to build these collaborations. And so we uh, are getting into more of a technical question here. Um, and I'm really watching the time very closely because we should close up. But Mala, Adam, do you have any quick answers to Anna Maria's question about how can we get more uh, and better of PBMCs out of, out of patient samples? I think Adam has dropped off, but I mean, I think it is a perennial problem. You, it, it, so it can only really be done by labs that know what they're doing. And so it just means you need to link up with with centers which have patients and labs that can maybe help you with both, I think, and, and probably focus on understanding detailed immune monitoring in the smaller subgroup or in the earlier phase of the trials. Mm -hmm. so that you could do more time points and you could collaborate very closely and then accept the fact that when you scale up to the bigger phase, you can't do that in most people. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Veronica, I'm still here. Can you hear me? Anyone? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I just, yeah, I, I agree with Mala here. I would say, you know, I'm all in favor of collecting you know, samples and doing the immunology to understand whether 
viral endpoints, at least you understand why. But you know, when it comes to more complicated questions where you need cells, um, using these later on in smaller ancillary studies where you can pick specific patient populations mm -hmm. and really do it at selected sites is probably the ideal way to go about that and, and just do a really deep focused research on, on, on specific patients that are gonna give you the most information. Good, well, thank you. Um, I think that um, that sums it up. And uh, I want to really thank everyone for, for the uh, very good uh, input into this panel discussion. We lost uh, Gavin to a fire alarm. We lost Carrie to uh, another pre-scheduled meeting, but we uh, also thank all the 82 participants that have hung in uh, for about half an hour extra. So thank you very much uh, for all your input, for all the talks. Capuchin asked me to remind everybody that we do uh, reconvene next Monday, same time, same place, or maybe it's a different link, I'm not sure, but same time. And uh, the first talk is going to be by Mara Dundry on biomarkers of CCC DNA expression. And I think that whole session next week will be another excellent uh, forum to, to really continue these discussions about updates on biomarkers and, and how we can use them best in our studies and eventually in clinical practice. So Adam, thank you for co-chairing this. And uh, Capuchin, I will pass it back to you for any final words. Great. Thank you so much, Renuka. Thank you, everybody. And yes, next week is same time and same place. So we look forward to um, seeing you again then. Okay. Good. And congratulations on a wonderful webinar. Thank you, Veronica, and everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.